Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan Foster. I'm a senior here at Cruise Springs High School, and I'm a part of the ISM program that Ms. Daphne teaches. And today I will be presenting my fall semester of 2019 uh, presentation called The Creation of Cataracts. So before I start, I'd like to give a quick disclaimer. Some of the information within my project has been taken from outside sources, which means, excuse me, uh, which means that I did not come up with all the information on my own. So this fall semester, I had the privilege of mentor or shadowing with my mentor, Dr. William McMullen, and he is an ophthalmologist at Coastal Eye Associates in Webster, Texas. And I also want to mention that his colleague, Ms. Brenda, was also very helpful in my ISM mentorship process. However, I do not have a picture of her uh, because she's not my technical mentor, but I have a picture of him and I and also his occupation or his uh, workplace. And before I continue, I also want to give a quick explanation of what an ophthalmologist is because I personally did not even know what that was whenever I found Dr. McMullen. But an ophthalmologist is a doctor who specializes in eye care and especially surgical eye care. And I'd also like to mention that Dr. McMullen is a specialist in the retina area or the posterior back eye of the area or area of the eye. And so what is ISM? ISM is a rigorous course that students can take in order to find out more about a career path that they're interested in. And through mentorship experience and also through um, hands-on experience, these students can learn what it's like to truly be a certain occupation. And also I'd like to say that um, ISM is, or the program of ISM expects the student to work independently and also to work at a collegiate level. And some basic course requirements include having to uh, record two activity hours a week and also three mentorship hours a week, and also having to write journal entries and activity, activity logs. And uh, we also have to create a pre uh, presentation, which I'm presenting right now, at the end of the semester that recaps a specific topic that we have learned over the course of our mentorship experience. And last but not least, we also were expected to create a weekly portfolio, which is an online representation of what we've been doing over the semester. And if anyone is interested in checking that out, I left a URL here. And so my particular project topic or uh, topic of study that I'm going to be addressing today is the focus of the formation of cataracts and via oil and gas retractomy surgeries. And I'll go more into what those surgeries are later on into my presentation. But furthermore, I will also be addressing which type of surgery led to a quicker formation of cataracts. And uh, I chose this, I personally chose this project because I knew it would teach me something that I had no background knowledge of. And I also thought it was really interesting because my mentor was not really sure about which one lasted longer because they've been doing it for so long. And I specifically chose my mentor and his type of profession because I am interested in pursuing the medical field in the future. And I thought it'd be really cool to see what it's like to be a specialist in the medical field rather than a general practitioner. So I thought it was really cool to work with someone who was a retina specialist. And for our project, we had to find 10 artifacts that we found on the daily in our mentorship site. And number one on the left is a slit lamp. And this slit lamp is a tool that ophthalmologists use to evaluate the patient's eye. And it, it gives more of a specific view of the back area of the eye, which is not really uh, visible to the normal eye. And the second picture here is a brochure that I was given in the beginning of my mentorship experience. And the title is Age-Related Macular Degeneration. And this is a disease that my mentor typically sees throughout the day because he does deal with older patients and the majority of older patients do get this disease. And the third picture is not the exact picture that is hung up in the wall on my mentorship site, but it does deal with the same thing. And this deals with uh, the HIPAA laws and how, and medical privacy laws, and pretty much just saying, you know, don't, don't share information that you learn and whatnot. 
And my fourth is a picture of my diary or diary journal that I have been uh, keeping log of for my project for looking for my patients. And the fifth picture here is a form or is a form that I like typically saw every day because I would look through the patient records and this is a medical history form and I would see this all the time. And the sixth picture here is a Avastin injection and I was truthfully a little weirded out seeing this for the first time, but Dr. McMullen uh, typically does this injection at least, or whenever I was him for three hours, uh, I think he did it at least like five times within his day. So I see that all the time. And this would, um, this would treat diseases such as wet macular degeneration. And the seventh here is a disease, or not disease, but a eye injury that could happen and it's retinal detachment. And that is something that he also dealt with on the daily. And the eighth picture over there is also another type of form for the patient records, but this is more of a uh, evaluation centered one. So as soon as a patient would come in, Dr. McMullen will take out this paper and he would give it to his assistant. And while he was using the slip lamp, he would say things out loud, like as he was seeing the cataracts, he would mention that, and then the assistant would write down the level of cataracts on that paper. And the ninth picture right there is of an OCT. And this is a type of machine that lets you see the retina or the back, the back layer of the eye. And the 10th one right here, my last one, is a couple of notes that I made throughout the process of my mentorship experience. And it showed, or I was having a lot of trouble figuring out the abbreviations because I never knew anything about um, ophthalmology before. But after making these notes, I did find it a lot easier to read the patient records. And so my product that I had made today is right there. And um, it is a 3D model of an eye. And it shows the basic, basic formations of the eye. And this will play in while I point out the important parts of the eye. So you can feel free to look at that model if you want to while I point this out. But um, so we have the cornea over there at the very beginning of the eye. And it's the outermost lens that focuses light. And the majority of the eye is just focusing light constantly. And the sclerola over there is the, is the white of the eye and it's a protective outer layer. And the pupil is a small hole in the eye that is in the iris and it changes shape for you to, for the light to come into the eye. And the iris is the colorful structure that you see, which is like brown, blue, and it's what holds the pupil. And the lens is, this is where cataracts occurs in the lens. And it's in the little, it's curled like that. And um, it's a transparent orb within the eye that reflects light. And the macula is something else that um, Dr. McMullen also dealt with. And it's responsible for seeing sharp vision in the center of your vision. And the optic disc is what connects the retina to the optic nerve. And the vitreous fluid is something also very important. Um, it's the pretty much the brown stuff that you see right there. And it's the jelly-like fluid that holds your eye together. And that plays a lot in what in my project. And the retina is what senses light and creates impulses. And I'd like to point out that my doctor or my uh, mentor, he dealt with the whole backside of the eye and also the lens. And so I would like to describe what a cataract actually is. And so the textbook definition is a clouding or loss of transparency of the eye and the the lens in the eye as a result of tissue breakdown and protein clumping. And there are three types of uh, cataracts. There are nuclear pterologic cataracts that develop in the central part of the lens. And there's also the cortical cataracts, which develop in the peripheral. And then there's also the posterior subcapsular cataracts, which develop in the back of the lens. And so while learning or while shadowing Mr. or Dr. Uh, McMullen, I found out that cataracts are scaled on a scale of one to four. And typically patients don't really have to worry if they have a one to two, but if they have a three or four plus, they should definitely get checked out. And so I also re researched the formation of cataracts and cataracts are usually formed because of aging or because of eye injury. 
and certain instances such as diabetes or health problems can lead to a quicker formation of uh, cataracts. And whenever the cataracts are formed, patients will typically see cloudy vision or very blurry vision like throughout, not just in certain areas of their eye. But as I said, um, as the cataract develops, that's whenever they will notice this vision. It's typically a slow developing uh, disease. And it shouldn't be, as I said, on a scale of one to four, uh, a patient really shouldn't worry if they're at one to two, but it really is up to them. But if they do decide to have surgery or remove the cataract at a three to four, it poses a bigger risk to their surgery. Things could go wrong. So it is recommended to get it fixed quickly. And so I'd like to also describe what a vitrectomy surgery is. I mentioned this earlier. So it is a procedure where the vitreous, which is the fluid-like substance that I mentioned earlier too, is removed uh, to get better access to the retina. And this helps for many different, or for many different ophthalmologists because this is what they deal with. And I'd also like to mention that vitrectomy surgery almost always leads to cataracts, which is the reason why this is a good project to work with vitrectomy surgeries and cataracts. And so, like I mentioned, there are two different vitrectomy surgeries. There's gas and oil. And so I'd like to give a textbook definition of a gas-based vitrectomy surgery. And it's a surgery where the gas bubble, a gas bubble is inserted into the eye in order to hold the retina in position, because like I said, the vitreous is taken out. So when that happens, the eye does not have anything to keep it in shape, if that makes any sense. And the types of diseases that could call for this um, type of surgery is macular degeneration and anything dealing with the retina really, since it's in the back of the eye. And also, I thought this was really interesting while learning about this disease or this uh, type of surgery, is that the patient should be expected to keep their head down because it will keep the bubble in place because if they don't, it'll mess, it, mess up the bubble a little bit. So, and obviously these patients are usually older, so it's harder for them to keep their head down, which usually leads to an even more increased uh, account for cataracts. And so I'd like to give, or I'd like to explain why or how the uh, vitrectomy surgeries are done. And it's usually outpatient and you don't need, it's not an insane procedure and it's not that risky, but you do call for some amount of anesthesia. And so as it starts out, there is an there is a anesthesia put into the eye and a microscope is used to look into the eye while they're doing the process. And a probe is used to pull out the vitrectomy fluid, as I said before, and uh, or the vitreous fluid. And whenever it's removed, the gas, whatever, there's different types of gases that they can put into the eye, but the gas is then placed into the area where the vitreous or the vitreous was to keep the eyes shape. And yes, said that. And so now going on to oil-based vitrectomies, this is practically the same thing. Everything is done as with the gas-based uh, vitrectomy surgery, but instead an oil, an oil uh, is injected into the vitreous gel. And so it does, there are certain situations that a, a patient would decide to have an oil rather than a gas, but it really depends on the patient. Like I said, it's a very open decision usually. Um, unless the doctor can tell that there is a good reason for a gas or an oil. And like I said, just like the gas-based surgeries, these are the typical types of diseases that can be, that can call for the surgery is macular degeneration and macular holes. And the process of vitrectomy surgeries is they will put a silicone oil into the open space. And just like with gas surgery, it's not, it's not risky, but um, they can also lead to bleeding on the eye and retinal detachment, just in case, uh, or it's just, in, it really depends on the patient and how they did during surgery. And so now looking at everything that I've, or after looking at everything that I've done, uh, the type of surgery that led to a quicker formation of cataracts was the, was a gas-based surgery, but this gas-based surgery was specifically the C3F8, and this C3F8 typically took around three to five months, like right after the patient would develop really bad cataracts. And with, I also got this information from looking at patient records 
and seeing how long it took them to develop these cataracts. And um, the SF6 uh, was a also type A, also no, another type of gas-based surgery, uh, but it did not take as quick as the C3F8. And the oil actually had a weird like range. So, but I, and overall the gas-based surgery was the one that took quicker. And the major factors that I learned that contributed to this were sex, which was typically male, and also the age, which is 60s through 80s, which is understandable because they're mostly older. And also medical history and uh, past, such as smoking and drinking and diabetes, they led to a quicker formation of cataracts too. And I believe that I can use this information or doctors can use this information in the future when describing to their patients what exactly the types of vitrectomy surgeries will entail. And I believe because not typically since they're older too, they don't really understand the, the risks. So I think having this information will be very interesting for them since they will know what could happen to them. And so we also had to do a current event for our project and mine was titled Technology makes physicians more efficient, reduces burnout. And this is, in general, just talking about how over the years, more, uh, more types of treatments have been found for things that weren't being able to treat it, be treated before. And so with this increase, more patients have been looking for ophthalmologists to treat them, which means uh, a lot more stress for ophthalmologists because they have more and more people and it said that it was just talking about how technology has helped reduce this stress. And I thought this connected to my project because pretty much all of the information that I got from my, from my patient records was from online. And without this technology, I would not have been able to find all of my information that I needed as quickly. And so for my conclusion, I have learned that the medical field is much more specific when it's calling to um, the specialist area. And I've also learned the pros and cons of being a medical worker. And for my semester project, I have learned a lot about the certain areas of the eye and what they do. And for my project in research, I learned a lot about protracting surgeries and what, what it's like to be in the day of the life of an ophthalmologist. And are there any questions from anyone? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good question. <Thank> you. <laughs>